Well, as we enter our <clears throat> uh, fourth week dealing with Revelation, but really the third week of dealing with the content, uh, I, I must just confess to you that uh, this is the presentation that I've been dreading. Um, uh, I've made many attempts in the last four or five days to divert, delay, avoid doing this um, with this section of the apocalypse. I've, I've tried all kinds of ways to avoid it, but finally yesterday I decided I had to come to grips with it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, my thought process does not coincide with, with uh, Revelation uh, 6 through 11. It just doesn't. And um, it is not only that it has to be decoded, but these chapters are complicated and repetitious. Um, however, to be faithful to what we're trying to do, it's irresponsible for me to pole vault over chapter six through 11 <laughs> and just skip it. Uh, and so, uh, here we go. Now, re remember, the first three chapters are the messages uh, to the churches, uh, what it means to be faithful. You can grab hold of that. And in Revelation 4 and 5, it has to do with the glory of God and uh, the, the, the role of the Lamb, Jesus. We can grab hold of that. And then in chapter 12 on, uh, we'll be able to grab hold of that. But... Uh, Folks, you can't grab hold of chapter 6 through 11. Uh, <clears throat> it's repetitious be in <clears throat> because uh, chapter 6 and 7 are the opening of the seven seals. And then the whole thing is sort of repeated in chapters 8 through 11 in the announcement of the seven trumpets. Uh, just a series of, of, uh, of visions that are um, complementary and reveal the worldview of John of Patmos. Remember the worldview. <clears throat> we, we have uh, uh, the battle. And <clears throat> in John's opinion, in terms of the time of the battle, there was the first resurrection. This was the resurrection of the martyrs and the faithful. And they would reign with God for a period of time, a thousand years. And during this time, the faithful would be protected and they would, if you will, reign with God in watching the battle and the uh, devastation to the unfaithful. And then you think that, so this worldview is, enables a person to answer the question, why do human beings fight with each other? Why is there a continuing battle of strife and war and persecution and famine? Well, according to this worldview, it's because of the power of good and evil, God and the devil vying for the obedience of the human beings and people are the ones that suffer the consequences of this battle, persecution, famine, and death. And so uh, it, it's complicated because it's not written about real occurrences. It is symbolic language about real occurrences. So it's all kinds of visions and symbols, but to understand a symbol, you've got to get behind it and understand uh, uh, what the real occurrences are. And so um, these chapters describe the battle between good and evil when all hell is breaking loose and uh, human beings suffering the consequences of fierce warfare. And the role of the faithful is martyrdom. 
being willing to die for the cause of good, for the cause of God. And the carrot on the end of the stick for martyrs, according to John of Patmos, was this reign with God to wait <coughs> and observe the destruction and war that was taking place. Now, remember for martyrs, there's always a carrot on the end of the stick that makes the decision of the martyr to be faithful, to be more rewarding. The carrot is more rewarding than any other option they have in life. And so there's always a carrot on the end of the stick for martyrs. And it's been a powerful influence of, of martyrs through, through the centuries. And in that time, for John of Patmos, it was the ultimate carrot at the end of the stick for the martyrs to be faithful, to reign with God and watch what was taking place. So 6 to 11 is what was taking place. Now, some decoding is necessary. We could take a couple hours to decode, but I'm just going to lift up a, a few examples that begin to make a little bit of sense. If you decide to read chapter 6 to 11, uh, Maybe just a little bit of decoding will, will help you grab a hold of it. Uh, number one, the, <clears throat> the number of the uh, faithful, which are going to be protected and reign with God, is 144,000. Now, you've got to understand Hebrew numerology, and that is that there's a, and uh, that number of 12,000 uh, represents unlimited. Uh, 12,000 times 12, the 12 tribes of Israel, represent uh, uh, unlimited numbers. <clears throat> and uh, uh, then there were other persons, faithful persons, that were not a part of the tribe that were added to the faithful. And so we must decode it first of all to understand that 144,000 is not a limit. Rather, 144,000 is infinity, unlimited. All you have to do to be a part of the group is to be faithful. And one of the marks of faithfulness was not agreeing with the Roman emperor that the Roman emperor was divine. And it was a mark put on the body of those who were willing to say the, <clears throat> the emperor is divine and Christians wouldn't do that. And most of the Christians were Jewish Christians. Some were not. And so 144,000 is unlimited, infinite, rather than limited and finite. And we know there are groups of Christians today who believe that 144,000 means a limit. But let's decode that right off the bat. No, it's unlimited, not limited. Then in this uh, <clears throat> section of Revelation, there's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And you can only understand this if you understand uh, Zechariah uh, 6, uh, 1 to 5 verses 1 to 5. That's when the four, four horsemen are, are mentioned, and so the apocalypse, again, has to do with the end times, the, the, uh, the coming end of the world, and it's uh, the hidden language um, about that. And so uh, <clears throat> the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, one was white, probably representing white always meant purity, probably representing because of the instrument of the weapon that is mentioned with the white, it's a bow, 
which was the weapon of the Parthians that were on the other side of the Euphrates River. Euphrates River was the limit of the Roman Empire. The Parthians were on the other side of that, and there was always the, the hope that the Parthians would invade Rome, uh, the Roman Empire. So you have the four horsemen of the apocalypse, one in, in white, uh, one in red, representing um, uh, bloodshed, one in black that represents death, and one in gray, which represents the color of decomposing bodies after their death. These were symbols of what was taking place in 95 AD. The possibility that the Parthians would destroy the Roman Empire, but the reality of bloodshed, death, and bodies. That was their world. So that's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Then you have the vivid descriptions of, of natural uh, calamities. And <clears throat> it all had to do with a mountain being on fire. We've got to decode that a little bit and realize that 16 years before John of Patmos wrote this letter, there was the eruption of the mountain Vesuvius that uh, covered uh, the city of Pompeii with lava and, and covered boats in the harbor. Well, these people knew what it meant for a mountain to erupt. And so this was <clears throat> the, uh, everybody knew about that uh, eruption throughout Asia Minor. And so therefore, when you read in these chapters of the natural calamities, you gotta realize that <clears throat> indeed, uh, these people, these listeners, these hearers, they knew what that meant with the mountain exploding. And then we see the reference to the number 42. Why is it? What in the world is that all about? Well, again, you've got to understand Jewish history. 42 months was the length of the term of Antioch Epiphanes in 167 BC. He was the emperor for 42 months, three and a half years. And what's important about Antioch Epiphanes? That emperor outlawed Judaism. And so anything you see about 42 is that symbol of the beginning of the elimination, the attempted elimination of the Jewish state and the Jewish people because they were outlawed by number 42, Antioch Epiphanes. Finally, there's a, well, a couple other, you have the seven angels. Again, uh, where do the seven angels come from? Well, the Apocrypha means intertestamental writings, writings between uh, the last book that's included in the Old Testament and the first book included in the New Testament. You have a couple hundred years of intertestamental writings, and a couple of those are Tobit and Enoch. And in those books are references to these seven angels who, quote, stood before God. And so, again, to uncode it, you have to go to the Apocrypha, not simply Zechariah or Daniel or Ezekiel. But finally, the Jewish temple. The Jewish temple had been destroyed in 70 AD. It, it laid in ruins. There was no, no more building, and all of a sudden, John is talking about the temple. Well, you've got to remember what happened to that understanding of the temple. After the temple was destroyed, all of a sudden, the temple became the symbolic language for the faithful people of God. 
It's in Paul's letter, first letter to Corinth, first Corinthians. It's in second Corinthians. It's in Peter, first Peter. It's in Ephesians as the church, the early church, the faithful growing into the holy temple and being the holy temple. And so when you see the temple referred to, it's not a building because all these books in the New Testament you see were known because they were written before the book of the Apocalypse to John. The Revelation was written. So these New Testament books are a part of the decoding of the message. So we have all of this language, and maybe that would just give you some insights as you read through these five chapters, if you choose to do that. And then in chapter 11, at the end of this, we have a, uh, an experience of victory, uh, not an experience, rather a glimpse of victory of what it's really going to be like uh, at the end, uh, the eschatological, the, the end time of the earth. Now, it turns out to be a false glimpse because uh, there's uh, more drama after chapter 11. But the final victory of good, of God, is envisioned. And you have the familiar words in Revelation 11:15, And he shall reign forever and ever. Ever heard that language before? course is straight out of Handel's Messiah and he shall reign forever and ever and that's a glimpse of the victory of <clears throat> at the time that they thought maybe the battle was going to be over but remember the worldview the, the devil was unleashed again and we'll pick that up next week so it was a glimpse of victory not the victory itself. Now, what does all this mean? <laughs> uh, I've, I've tried to unpack it for you to make sense out of nonsense, and it's really, uh, <laughs> uh, from the reader, it, it feels like nonsense. But uh, that's what, you know, nonsense is no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. But with decoding and understanding the battle of this worldview that is taking place, it, it starts to make a little bit of sense. Now, I've just picked up uh, three messages and meanings uh, for those of us who do not describe to the worldview, who do not believe that the world's coming to an end in uh, the next year or two, and most of us are not dualists. Some of us might be, but for those of us who don't buy into who John of Patmos was in his thinking, what are the messages? First of all, martyrdom is powerful. Um, the, the meaning of martyrdom is found in these chapters. As I said before, there's always a carrot on the end of the stick. It, it's a reward that surpasses any other experience that a person could have in life. And um, it is played out in so many ways. A quick story, a friend of mine, Ellen Chaplin of Karen and mine, flew from France to New York City on an airplane. And then eight hours later, the, the same airplane left New York City and mysteriously fell into the ocean and killed everyone aboard. Uh, this is, what, 25 years ago? Everyone who was on the flight from Paris to New York was interviewed uh, by the FBI. And Ellen, a friend of ours, was interviewed because they wanted to know if they saw anything different or strange or anything on the flight coming. Well, it ended up being classified as a pilot error. And the error just might have been his religious beliefs that indeed if he died as a faithful person, as a martyr, he would be given the pleasure of 15 maidens 
in his life after death. Martyrdom is powerful. And that's, I think, the first message that we've got to take seriously from these chapters. It enabled people at that time to go to prison and die, occasionally been be thrown to the lions in the Colosseum to be killed at the roar of the throng watching it take place. Martyrdom is powerful. Secondly, the understanding of, of this chapter is that judgment is real. How that is experienced is different. For some, God is the executor of judgment. For others, God sets the standards of love and people experience judgment as we miss the mark of love. But judgment is real. Thirdly, the foundation of hope is that on the other side, there will always be love. Okay, a lot there. Let's think about some stuff before Sunday. First of all, uh, martyrdom is common experienced in every generation by extremists in Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. What are the historic and contemporary examples of the power of martyrdom? Secondly, what is your experience in the difference between Believing in God as the God of judgment as over against experiencing judgment as a consequence of missing the mark of God's high calling. Finally, when have you personally found it most difficult to believe in the final triumph of the love of God on the other side that indeed love will reign forever and ever. Um, let's look forward to Sunday. Thank you.